Especially of an animal in a wild state after escape from captivity or domestication. Alcatraz, Arab Spring, one billion rising. Freedom schools, the Maroons, rebellion thriving. We've been rising since the dawn of creation. Sun in the blood of our veins, liberation runs. From- Welcome to Feral Visions, a decolonial feminist podcast brought to you by the grassroots adult freedom school Liberation Spring. I'm your host, Anjali Nathupadia. Let's begin with a content note or trigger warning. Here at Feral Visions, we go deep, and that often means courageously addressing imperialist, white supremacist, cis-heteropatriarchal, capitalist settler colonialism in order to support healing and transformation. Bypassing isn't an option. The only way out is through. The time for denial is over, and today's a great day to keep it real. Since we're unapologetically truth-telling, please practice excellent self and community care while listening. To begin on that note, I invite you to join me for one deep breath right now so that we can be as present as is realistically possible moving forward with this dialogue. If you're feeling it, do inhale then exhale with me right now. Thank you for showing up to do this work. Let's dive right in. To the place where we can all attain emancipation from oppression, break the chains from Haiti to Tibet and worldwide. Don't forget the resistance in our roots and resilience in our breath. In the blood of our veins, liberation runs. We are standing on the shoulders of the ancient ones. Dr. Lewis Gordon is professor and head of the Department of Philosophy at Yukon Stores and honorary president of the Global Center for Advanced Studies. He previously taught at Brown University, where he founded the Department of Africana Studies, and Temple University, where he was the Laura H. Cornell Professor of Philosophy and founder of the Center for Afro-Jewish Studies and the Institute for the Study of Race and Social Thought. His visiting appointments include philosophy and government at the University of the West Indies at Mona, Jamaica, visiting professor at the University of Johannesburg, and honorary professor in Uhuru, the unit for the humanities at the university currently known as Rhodes in South Africa, where he was formerly the Nelson Mandela Distinguished Visiting Chair in Political and International Studies. His previous appointments include the Boaventura de Sosa Santos Chair in the Faculty for Economics at the University of Coimbra, Portugal, the European Union Chair in Europhilosophy at the Université Toulouse Jean Jaurès, France, writer and resident at the Burbeck School of Law at the University of London, professor of Africana Studies, Contemporary Religious Thought and Modern Culture and Media at Brown University, visiting professor of African and African-American Studies at Yale University, and philosophy and African-American Studies at Purdue University. He's the author of many books, including the 2021 Freedom, Justice, and Decolonization, the 2021 On Philosophy, Decolonization, and Race, and the forthcoming Fear of Black Consciousness. A few of his major works include the 1995 book Bad Faith and Anti-Black Racism, Fanon and the Crisis of European Man, the 1997 Her Majesty's Other Children, which won the Gustavus Meyer Award for Outstanding Work on Human Rights, the 2000 book Existentia Africana, the 2006 Disciplinary Decadence, the 2008 An Introduction to Africana Philosophy, the 2015 What Fanon Said, the 2006 co-authored A Companion to African American Studies, and the 2006 Not Only the Master's Tools. He co-edits the journal Philosophy and Global Affairs, the book series Global Critical Caribbean Thought, and the book series Academics, Politics, and Society in the Post-COVID World. 
He's a former president of the Caribbean Philosophical Association, for which he now serves as its chairperson of awards and global collaborations. We talk about Imhotep, suppressed comedic intellectual histories, the healthiness of suffering under oppression, and the narcissism of white supremacy in nutrition and education. Well, thank you so much for being down to take the time to connect. Uh, you know, I actually first found out about your work when I was minoring in philosophy and in an existentialism class. I'm just wondering where in the hell the people of color were. And so I'm <laughs> <laughs> to find out about your book on Africana existentialism. So I have been super into what you have shared and written since that time. So thank you so much, by the way. Oh, well, thank you. And the short answer to that is we've 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 been there all along, but hidden in plain sight. Thank you precisely, right? Uh, well, you know, I especially wanted to connect with you around a question that I get so much from students of mine in this grassroots public educational space that I teach in, who are either therapists or they work in the realm of mental health or they work in the so-called somatics industry who have been for the most part in their training subjected to allegedly apolitical material, um, material that is not explicitly politicized in the least. And so it's been a project of many years of encouraging folks to read Fanon to be able to get a sense of what might actually be more substantially liberatory for them to be doing in the spaces in which they're operating to support them, right? Addressing some of the omissions that they've identified within their training. And so I would love to get going by talking with you a little bit about that. So for folks mostly in the settler colonial US doing work in these healing spaces, what you imagine it would be most supportive for them to understand from Fanon's body of work outside of the context of supporting material decolonization full time. Sure. Well, well, the first thing to bear in mind is that medicine, health, uh, those have always been a feature of political life. And in fact, one of the big problems we have has been the subversion of those through people, say, invested in capitalism or colonialism, trying to make economic health, <laughs> profit health, more important than other dimensions of health. So that's the first thing. It's always been an issue of health, okay? Uh, in, the end, in the end, there's a basic question. I mean, on, on a basic level right now, for instance, as we're dealing with what's called social distancing, social distancing is a canard. It's physical distancing. That's the real thing. You, you, can, be, you can be physically distant, but socially close. For instance, we're able to communicate now from great distances. And as you know, if you pick a married couple, who are on the rocks, they could be physically close, but socially distant, <laughs> okay? So the thing to bear in mind is that for human beings, we're craving, we need social world, the social world. So that's the first thing. But the second thing is we need the social world with very specific people. So when we live together with people whom we don't love or we're not really treasuring, we need to still find a way to live together. And that is really where you begin to have a political society. So the big problem from day one has been when you had disparate groups of people living together, how can they live together in a healthy way? And this is one of the reasons why throughout history, some of the greatest philosophers, political thinkers, et cetera, were medical people. The, the, the most ancient was Hotep, okay? Yeah, uh, Imhotep. He was a physician, an architect, a philosopher, et cetera. There was Lady Preshet. She was a physician in ancient Egypt, right? Or Kemet's the right name, okay? And even among the more familiar names for the European folks, the Arist Aristotle was a physician. We can go through people like John Locke, a physician. We can go all the way through to people like William James, Carl Jasper's a physician. Franz Fanon, a physician. Wittgenstein, a lot of names people know in philosophy. He was a nurse. He was an engineer and a nurse. Mary Seiko, a nurse. So I could go on and on. When we could talk about people in Chinese medicine, we could talk about, um, if we talk about indigenous philosophers, if we talk about Mesoamerican philosophy, lots of physicians. So the question, it is no contradiction 
in thinking about a healthy society and thinking about physical individual health. It, it, it's, it's just a, it's a false dilemma. The second to bear in mind as people think about this is, and this is something that Fanon observed beautifully, okay? We could pick, pick, we'll focus on Franz Fanon here because he directly talked about colonialism. He directly talked about medicine. He directly talked about psychiatric medicine, et cetera. Well, I'm, I, wanna, I wanna take it back to two, two examples when Fanon was an intern, okay? When Fanon was an intern, he noticed something very peculiar. He noticed that there would be people coming to him for medical help, for, for mental health issues. And they would say, you know, doc, uh, they would say, you know, to him, Fanon, you know, something's wrong with me, blah, blah, blah. And Fanon was careful to make a distinction between a patient and a client. A client is a, is a person who may not be ill. A patient is someone who is a client and also ill. Now, why distinction this distinction? Well, when Fanon would interview certain people, he would discover a paradox. The paradox is they're suffering because they're healthy. You see, and you know, sometimes people would say to you, if you're feeling pain, that's good because it's a sign that your body's fighting back. Well, think about it. If someone says, comes and says, when I go to work, I'm humiliated on the basis of my gender or my race. I'm very angry. They treat me like nothing. When I go out in the world, the police stop me all the time. When I, you, you know the long list, right? If you're an indigenous person, the idea that there could people come in and maraud your communities, do whatever they want to you, and you're the one who's put in prison. If you're angry at that, if you're going through a suffering, Fanon would say, you're going through that because you're healthy. Think about it. It would be very weird to say all those things are happening to you and you're completely happy. <laughs> you're completely at home with misogyny, racial degradation, homophobia, the list goes on. And you're just so happy with it. You would have to be a pretty sick person. <laughs> then Fed Otto would say, you need help. So his point at this moment is you're suffering because the society is sick. Its legal institutions are problematic. And if you can understand that, then the best uh, prognosis, the best, the best recommendation is for you go, to go out there and be politically active. Because even, even in situations where you're not immediately say winning, right? Your dignity, your respect, your sense of your humanity is maintained because you're doing something about your condition. So this comes to the clear point, okay? The second point, Fanon noticed something very peculiar. And this is what he wrote his actual accepted dissertation on. His first dissertation that he proposed, they rejected, uh, which was Pot Noir Mas Blanc, translated means black skin, white mask. And that's because the physicians who were his professors were positivists or physicalists physicians. For them, if you can't, it's just like right now, there are many people who are long haulers with COVID-19. And when they'd go, the physicians would look at them and say, they don't see anything wrong, but there's so many people suffering. And in some cases, they just drop dead a few days later. There is something there, but clearly this virus is not following the expected rules of how medical diagnosis is normally conducted. Well, similarly, the problem, what Fanon was pointing out, he built that first dissertation on the example I just gave. What it is to try to make a person adjusted to a sick society, when the real issue is to change the society. In other words, there's something wrong with a society that makes healthy people suffer. If you're unhealthy and you're suffering, that's a little different. That means a healthy society will now respond to alleviate your suffering. So either way, it still comes down to the problem of whether the society is healthy or not. Anyway, they didn't want that. They wanted him to talk about whether there's a legion, whether there's an aneurysm, whether, you know, that kind of a thing. Now, Fanon was a very astute person. He always had plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D. His plan B, when he was, um, 
working in various wards, he carefully kept data on people with a unique illness called uh, a Friedrich's disease, okay? And this is a degenerative disease of the nervous system. And he kept a lot of notes and he, he interviewed the patients, etc. Now, why was he doing this? Is because Fanon had an hypothesis, right? He had a, that he wanted to check. And, and the hypothesis was that physical illness doesn't have to entail mental illness. So the old model wants to say, if you're mentally ill, it must be something in your brain. So he kept a lot of data and because of this, he was able to write a second dissertation in two weeks, which is the one that earned him his doctorate. And what he discovered was this. He noticed that among the patients, there are those who are going through this horrible degenerative disease where you get to the point where you can't move your hands, your feet, you know, you can't wipe yourself, et cetera. And it's even worse when you look around you the people are to take care of you if they don't have respect for you. They could talk about you in di disparaging ways. They could put you down. In some cases, they even rape you. I mean, you know, there are all kinds of things that are just horrible. And you can't move your mouth, your legs, your arms. And as people are going through this illness, the degeneration, he interviewed them. And Fennel noticed something rather striking. There are patients who, when they're suffering from a degenerative disease, are, are horrified by it, and they start worrying about their families. They start thinking about their, 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 their spouse, their children, their parents. They may say, oh, gee, you know, I'll try my best, etc." Then there are some people, if they hear it, they don't care about anybody. So like, I don't mind if other people get sick. This just shouldn't happen to me. <laughs> So Fanon noticed a correlation between mental illness and narcissism. And in fact, if you look at black skin, white mass, he says a lot of white supremacy is narcissism. With a problem of a colonial and racist societies, it sets up as the model of a normal individual, a narcissist. And we've seen this right now with the right wing all over the place. You know, Donald Trump was just a big malignant narcissist. A lot of the people who are supporting him and they run around, they're, they're fighting not for freedom, justice, and democracy, they're fighting for the superiority of themselves to get those goods and to keep them from others. That's a narcissist. And so, so the short version then Fanon demonstrated in his dissertation is that neurological illness is separate from mental illness. However, it connects back to his original dissertation because what do you do if some societies encourage narcissism as, no, as what it is to be normal? It will increase the presence of mental illness in the society, which means that there's a political uh, dimension of the spread of mental illness. And we know this already, because if you look all over the world, everywhere where there are affluent and also white supremacist societies, there are higher instances of mental illness. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I'm super appreciative of your drawing out a sort of Fanonian take on narcissism because this, right, is sort of field of right study around so-called cluster B personality disorders um, is one of the more, if possibly only sort of redeeming section of the DSM as I understand it intellectually and politically. And so it's wild in the sense that also here we see so few people having a rigorous politicized take on psychopathy, sociopathy, narcissism. Uh, and so it's so important to then really take seriously if these are in the least meaningful categories, what would a decolonial understanding of them potentially look like? Uh, especially as we see, right, the settler colonial US exporting what we could call narcissism and really normalizing and naturalizing these kinds of tendencies. Sure, it's, it's, it, 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 and there, there, there are two places you see this very, very acutely. <laughs> one is in nutrition and the other one's in education. 
uh, I'll start with nutrition. Uh, it, it's really striking that if you look at a lot of, uh, until very recently, where more um, uh, people from the underside, so to speak, more people from the global south, more people, uh, indigenous peoples, more people from Southern Africa get involved in, in nutrition. It's really striking what you discover because you see, uh, I'll give you an example through, uh, when I was teaching uh, at Brown University, I advised an undergraduate who did a, 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 an honors thesis in community health. And she, I advised her because she took a course I taught, a, a large course, it's a very popular course called Rastafari, Philosophy, Politics, and Theology. And so she decided to, to conduct an epidemiological study on Rasta women. So, and, and to do it, she looked at Rasta women in Brooklyn and in Jamaica, okay? Because she wanted to have two different places to, in the United States and in Jamaica. Now, one of the things, the moment you're gonna look at Rasta women, the first thing most people would tell you in medicine is, well, they're around a lot of marijuana smoking. So you'd expect to have eye instances if you're in a, of, of say lung cancer or some, you know, all kinds of things that people tell you is wrong. And then she compared them also with women from the same ethnic groups, you know, Jamaican women in Brooklyn and in Kingston, Jamaica. Well, she discovered consistently the Rasta women were healthier. And so then she had to find an explanation. And she noticed several things as she did this. First of all, diet. Rastas have a diet that's either vegan or pescatarian. They'll eat fish, or, but a high vegetable, low salt, low fat diet, rich in vitamin, you know, fiber and nutrition, sir. So that's pretty, right? Obvious. No dairy, okay? Second, she noticed something that Fanon noticed, self-esteem. If you're, if you are, what, what Rasta society basically tells you is you shouldn't be ashamed of being a black person. You should be proud of it. You should be healthy. You should, you should understand if you're a woman and from their point of view, whether you're a, you know, straight or gay uh, Rasta woman, you know, the point is you're a queen. <laughs> You're, you walk with pride, you're proud. You're not gonna look at your body and say it's ugly because you have, if your hips are big or, or if you're thin, you're not, you know, you're gonna think differently. The other thing is Rasta society requires you to read a lot and argue a lot. And anyway, so she began to say, wow, these women are really healthy. And then she looked at the, 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 the other women and they're dealing with all kinds of health in, in conditions from hypertension to blah, blah, blah. And then she, she looked at their diets. And what she noticed is a lot of the women who are unhealthy were following a lot of diets that were actually re recommended at the time by organizations like the World Health Organization because they were basing it on what it, a diet of a Northern European who has developed the ability to process lactose. So, so the idea of trying to make the rest of the world live like somebody in Northern England or in um, Denmark, <laughs> it, it, it's unhealthy for them. So, so that's a, one example, okay? And now we pick education as another example. You know, if, if I highly recommend for the listeners to look at that television series, mini series, small acts, if they could look at, it, look at it, but particularly the last two episodes because they're devoted to education. But it was, something that Paulo Freire noticed in um, Brazil. And what he noticed is this, you see, colonial educational models actually designed for the dehumanization of certain people. And it's designed for, for the regulation of society by lower classes, of, that, that, that stratify lower classes of people. So what it takes out lives of, of many people in the working classes, or many people who are black and brown or indigenous, those so-called education systems, which are designed on certification, not education. Because if you think about the colonial lords and the upper classes, they have tutors and you know, for them, there's no limit. But for everybody else, 
it inculcates, it pressures them into a world of, of, of uh, eradicated goals. It limits their options. To put it directly, colonial so-called education is um, to eliminate possibility from your life. And if you take possibility out of people's lives, they cannot grow. And in fact, the word educate is from educare. It means to draw out, to make grow, <laughs> right? So once you put this together, if people are to grow, they need agency. They need to see what they can do to grow, to be part of their education. And what Paulo Freire, Fanon, Fanon talks about this more explicitly in a book called Year Five of the Algerian Revolution, right? Lang Sang, the, you know, Revolution Algerian. And, um, and what he noticed is that a lot of people who at one time believed they couldn't do or learn certain things, when they're involved in the revolutionary struggle, learn to do them very quickly. Yeah, and the difference is no one is just telling them, for instance, um, about medicine, around health. It's not somebody's just telling them, take these pills or telling them, you know, they're, you know, moralistically they're bad. They learn how to dress wounds, what to, why you shouldn't drink water if you have a bullet wound, stuff like that. They, in other words, explain to them. And of course, it means they're learning. And in fact, one of the things I learned from reading people like Freire, Fanon, you could see it in some of the early writings of Angela Davis, and there are many others, um, is this. Nobody knows everything. And once you know this, it means everybody's trying to learn something. So even with, say, myself, with all my, my accolades and books and articles and so forth, my students are always shocked because I, I call myself a student. All research is, is just you're continuing to learn. And along the way, you practice that art through writing and other resources. And so it means you continue to grow. Because you already noticed, there are these specialists, these professors out there who they write their one book and they stop. <laughs> Those people have ceased to grow. Whereas people who continue to grow, that means then your relationship to students is different. Your student's a co-learner. It means then it's not simply what your student can learn from you. It's what you can also learn from your student. Because she or he, although may not be as advanced as you in the study of the subject, brings to it different experiences that may illuminate the subject in ways that you have not thought of. And everybody who is an excellent teacher knows this, that every semester you learn from your students. And if your students see that you can learn from them, they could now respect how they can learn from you. So you shift from the question of being authoritarian <laughs> or the authority to now being a, an authoritative community, a community that respects each other's ability to learn. And you could see that that is a decol decolonial educational practice. So it's pretty clear you can have decolonial medicine in the first example, in terms of nutrition, and there are many other examples there. And you can have it in terms of education as well, but they're both connected to health because Fanon, and not only Fanon, others, uh, uh, in, including William James, but you know, there, there are many we could think of. And I brought up Mary Seacole, they had a very community rich understanding of health and medicine. Absolutely. Uh, appreciate your bringing in that ITIL is vital, as I've heard it in the past, right? Such an important example. Uh, and, you know, I want to put this in conversation with your starting off bringing up Imhotep, and I really appreciate that reference also, and want to situate it within the context of something I've been concerned about, actually, um, I'm sure you might have heard young folks invoke the phrase hotep fuckery to reference, right, <laughs> something that might be considered a sort of anti-intellectual take on uh, Afrocentrism that actually a lot of people frame as deeply disrespectful, even that phrase hotep fuckery, right? So I'm wondering if you might be willing to uh, take it back to elaborate on 
that figure actually, because I know this is something that's so important for so many folks as they're engaging in processes of right ancestrally meaningful reclamation of suppressed histories um, and taking that process seriously with rigor in a way that can sometimes just get sort of castigated or delegitimated out of hand without even recognizing, oh no, there's so much to get into when we set down the scientism, when we set down the Eurocentric rationalism and empiricism, like that's the shit that's anti-intellectual, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so would you be down to elaborate on that figure? And again, especially situating them within the context of research and science and um, being a physician? Sure. Well, the first thing to remember, colonialism is arrogant. And one of its best techniques is to condition us not to question and think further. So there's a, an extent to which it has been um, um, such a form of knowledge bullying, epistemological bullying, that it's like gaslighting a whole world of people to the point where they don't look further. So it's to the point where many people have taken the position that anything that works, anything that is correct, must have been created by a person who was white or European, must have come out of the global North, you see? And must be, you know, it's, it's striking to me, for instance, how many people believe that a lot of things that were invented in history invented uh, by whites, really white men, and they have no idea of how many women have invented and how many times uh, women's names have been masculinized or erased. And it's a similar thing, a lot of people, so you have to start by having people ask the right questions. A good example, I usually begin by, when I teach sometimes I ask students, try to imagine what your morning would have been like if you took a lot of black people and women out of history. And they say, well, what do you mean? And I explain that, well, first of all, you couldn't turn on your light this morning because the filament was invented by Latimer, a black person. <laughs> you couldn't use a toilet because the toilets were invented by blacks. The cotton on your clothes, the cotton gin, was not invented by Eli Whitney. It was invented by a slave. It's just slave, an enslaved person. It's just enslaved people couldn't own patents. So there are a whole lot of white men in history who are remembered as geniuses when they didn't do squat. All they did was they went and patent what a black person did and received the capital, I mean, and the profits for it. Thomas Edison is an example. He had a company where he, just, he employed a lot of very gifted people, but his name was on the pens, as an example. You wouldn't be able to use, you and I wouldn't be able to communicate right now with the wireless technology because a very, uh, a, a, a Jewish actress just known for her beauty, Hattie Lamar, but people didn't know that she was, a, she was developed wireless technology. She was working, yeah, she was working for the military. <laughs> And that's actually, and to, yeah, to develop wireless technology. Anyway, the list goes on. And so once you ask that question, it's like, oh, okay. And there, so there's a lot in history and even down to foods. There are foods that we don't even real, understand that the, the innovations in them were done by a variety of communities on a context where there's no way to have been able even to digest those foods without doing changes to them. And so, so, so that's the start. Then if we go back further, we need to understand that language, there's a way in which we imagine, for instance, we're speaking English now, but a lot of people don't understand that English is a very creolized language. If, if you took out a lot of the, the, the various indigenous people's words, the various Arabic words, the variety, a lot of, most English speakers don't even know the word soda is Arabic. You begin to take, <laughs> yeah. You begin to take out loads and loads. You're, you're not left with much that a contemporary English speaker could understand. Now, this is what's crucial because it tells you something about the past. Because the, the false story is a group of individually smart, powerful people go and conquer people and spread their ideas across the world. Absolutely false. It's a dialectical complex mechanism of people learning from each other 
And it's, it's that in the academic misrepresentation of the past, it's, it, 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 it purges those people and creates a false narrative. So it's important to learn to be critical and questioning and, and say, yo, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> and you, you can begin from there. It's just like whenever I, I mention this exercise or even if I mention the computer, right? Uh, the algorithm for the computer was developed by Ada Lovelace, who's by a woman, right? And uh, if she hadn't done that, Again, we wouldn't be communicating this way right now. So there's not so at that moment they begin to ask what what's going on here, and then you know it's a pattern with all these people who are inventing these things. They tend to be in situations where the necessity of inventing those things is there. It makes sense why an enslaved person would develop the cotton gin because picking seeds out of cotton sucks, and it makes sense where. Uh, a, a, a woman who is entrusted to just um, um, copy it at a mathematician's work would take the time to learn the math and say, this algorithm doesn't add up and use her imagination to, to figure out a way to do it better. You see what I'm getting at? Uh, people are creative, but creativity mixed with necessity. Wow, that creates, that, that leads to a lot. Now. The problem is too many people try to look at the past as if colonialism had nothing to do with it. As if, and, and because of that, they also don't take the time to learn certain things like the different languages. So I'll give you an example. Right now I'm teaching a course called um, Topics in Africana, African Diasporic Philosophy. And I teach it in different parts. Each semester I focus on a theme. And this semester I'm focusing on the philosophy of history and the history of philosophy. Because a lot of people don't look at history as, this, as a philosophical problem. But W.B. Du Bois did. And Anthony F. M. Mann from Haiti did. And I could go through a long list of people who did, including the Afrocentrists. And the thing about the Afrocentrists is a lot of people don't understand that it's not only the racism imposed against black people, but internal to black people's communities, there are black people who have adopted anti-black racist attitudes. We should be no more critical of an Africologist or an Afrocentrist than we would be of anybody else. But there's a double standard. We expect there is a presumed illegitimacy of the Afrocentrist and a presumed legitimacy of the Eurocentrist. You see? So when I met Afrocentrists, I just read their stuff. <laughs> I mean, that's, and that, that's all. And if some things don't add up, then I go and learn more. What's interesting that the people don't know is that the the foundational scholars that led to what we call uh, Afrocentrism today. And a lot of people don't understand, it's not really, the, 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 Afro, the people who, who are Afrocentric scholars, such as Malefi Asante or Malana Karenga and you know, um, Ama Mazama and others, um, they don't think their language is perfect. They see their language as more strategic. And what I mean by that is, if they were to use exclusively the African terms and concepts, many people wouldn't understand them. So they had to work with what they have. So for instance, um, I had a conversation with Malefe Asante where I pointed out that why, you know, when he says Africology, it's a hybrid term of Africa and the Greek term logos. And he said he knows, but the thing is, because in the academy, we tend to have the logos on the end, like biology, anthropology, it, it works for the Western Academy to do that. So in, in other words, this man isn't dumb. He knows what he's doing. And similarly, before when they were combating Eurocentrism, and remember the writings against Eurocentrism, they were there in Samir Amin's work from uh, Egypt. He was just saying, you need first to center yourself to respect where you're coming from in order to deal with the fact that you're being forced into the Eurocentric paradigm. Their argument wasn't that the Afrocentric one is the answer to everything. They see it as a kind of inoculant 
against the infection of Eurocentrism. But the traditions they're appealing to go back to people like Sheikh Anta Diop and people like Antony Fermin in the 19th century who knew all the European stuff, but they knew the limitations because they knew the African materials. And, but a lot of, what a lot of people don't realize is there were a lot of European, uh, not a lot, I mean, there were European scholars and theorists who, if you were not to know they were European, would read them as Afrocentrists. And the, re the reason is um, that they took the time to study the past and what they were learning from the past, they didn't start from the premise that black people had to be inferior. So if you look at people such as Massey or even someone like Franz Boas in the 19th century, uh, they didn't take the position that African people were not human beings. In fact, they understood very well, very well, that most of the history of our species were African people. I mean, today we call them African. They had no reason to call themselves African, uh, but, but some did. And I'll explain why in a second. But for, you know, human, Homo sapiens have been around around 220,000 years. Uh, some people say a little more. But, you know, the people we call white today, morphological white people, have only been around six to eight, maybe at best 10,000 years. So that means about 210,000 years of humanity has been exclusively what we call today black or brown people. Now, what's interesting and Boaz, I'll give an example that will bring this out, and then I'll go back to some of what you said before. W.B. Du Bois had invited Frank, um, Franz Boaz to come and speak for a commencement at Atlanta University. And he wanted him to speak on race because Boaz was writing all these articles against race and racism and so forth. And Boaz said, you really want me to come to a group of black students and talk to them about race. They know about race. <laughs> they know about racism. He says, I want to talk about something they may be unaware of. And the boy said, what was that? And he said, African history. And the boy was just like, what do you mean? Because this is the Du Bois before he became the Du Bois who wrote the world of in Africa. This is the earlier Du Bois. And Boy said, well, one of the greatest damages done to black people is to convince black people that they were not agents of history. Most of the revolutions in history took place in Africa and even the ones in Europe, there weren't any white people then. There were black people in Europe. And it's important for them to know everything from language to writing to the wheel, from fire, all the way through to medicine. And he just kept, and Du Bois was shocked because see Du Bois had bought into the view that when Europeans colonized and kidnapped Africans, they were civilizing Africans. And, the, and Franz Boas said that was false. There were, there were long standing African trade routes all the way through to Asia. There were, there were African cities, the list goes on. And it, remember, this is a, 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 a German Jewish man speaking, right? So, I mean, he's just saying, he's, he's not, he says, there's nothing romantic about it, it's just true. And he said, and just like uh, ancient Egypt, a lot of people know Egypt is the Greek name. It's Egepsos, that's the Greek name. It's Kemet is the proper name. He said, yeah, it was, black. it was just black. A lot of people, you see, they speak without studying or knowing. You see, a lot of people today, when they talk about ancient Egypt, they don't realize in their minds, they're talking about the kind of Egypt that was around the period of, for Christians, Jesus. They don't, <laughs> when I teach my classes, I begin, with a writing from Antef that was more than 1500 years before the first Greek philosopher spoke. And it's on philosophy. The, here, and here's the thing. A lot of people don't realize, first of all, that there was an old, an old kingdom, Egypt, or Kemet, a middle kingdom, and a new kingdom. All you gotta do is go to any museum and go to the old kingdom and you look around, every image is of black people. You go to the Middle Kingdom, a few thousand, you know, years later, you see brown and black. And by the time you get to the New Kingdom, which is by the period just about ending where you get the, the Macedonians coming in, the Romans and all of that, and Persians, 
then you see a multiracial people. It's just, in other words, it makes sense. But there are things about ancient Kemet people don't realize. The Nile River flows from the south, north. It empties into the Mediterranean Sea. So upper Egypt or upper Kemet is in the south, going towards places like, um, you know, Uganda and, uh, you know, Kenya and Ethiopia and those. Lower Egypt or lower Kemet is in the north by the Mediterranean. So that already changes the whole understanding. Second, many people who talk about these places don't know the language. I study Medinetor. And when you study the language, you'll discover all kinds of surprising things, okay? You discover things that make sense, such as a more ancient language, people don't have the economy of expression we have today. So they tend to use root words and build them up to perform certain tasks. So if I'm going to drink from my cup, I just say I pick up the cup and drink. But in a society where everything has certain meaning, you may have specific words for picking up the cup with your right hand versus your left hand. You may specify the distinction between a sacramental cup, a regular cup, etc. And these are all nuances in ancient languages. So uh, it's a very technical thing I'm talking about, but the short version of what it leads to is racism imposed upon the past wants to, they, because um, we're discovering through genetics that we're just one species, uh, that pissed off a lot of the racists. They wanted to believe there was an original white race and deviation was in blacks. It turns out there was just black people and the deviation is whites. <laughs> so, right, that's the first thing. But the second thing is once they find out that where all white people are, are just lightened up black people, for them, that's horrific, right? Because they're racist. So then they want to create a cultural distance. So they created these fictional views of looking at European languages and stuff as so separate. And that way they could say they were distinct and, 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 and not connected causally to the African ones. And it's completely false. It makes absolute sense that a group of ancient Homo sapiens, as they moved north and moved west and moved through, their language will change a bit, but you should be able to follow it archaeolinguistically to the past. And that is why it turns out a lot of, I, I show my students all the time, a lot of the African foundations of a lot of European languages. You know, a good example is, I give a simple one for the listeners. Uh, the word from which you get uh, philosophy is usually philia and sophia. Sophia means wisdom. Well, it turns out it's because um, the ancient Greek speaking people pronounce b, f, f, like f. And the African word is sabayat, and it means wise teachings. Okay? So sabayat became sophayat, became sophia. Now, the root for wisdom was sa, or what's, oh, I'm sorry, say, right? And that word you could find in Portuguese and Spanish when people say Saba, <laughs> you see what I'm saying? You see how it's connected to knowledge. But there is also a lot of complex his histories. There are words that are connected to forms of science that are heavily gendered. And that's because the, in the, the earliest mathematicians were female. The earliest scientists were female. And the ancient um, Medunetra term for those communities was uh, Rek or Rex or Reket. And that's where today you get Rex or Reckon. See how it's linked to knowledge. Now, here's the important part. You see, although they were majority female, these societies were much more gender fluid than today. So there are certain males who may, could be in female communities as females. And that's how they learned. You get, and you, there are a lot of myths. I teach courses on myths where I could show how the myths actually are connected to historical things, okay? And so once you put that all together, you can understand, if you understand the language, that this isn't mumbo jumbo stuff. This is actual human science. So even the word Africa from the language Meruneter, Afri means um, from, from the, and Kha means life's source or womb. And it makes sense in a, in a, if upper, upper Kemet or Egypt is to the south, then the source of humanity, you could see how it duplicates itself in imagining the womb flowing down the womb. 
So it turns out Africa is an African word. <laughs> now, these are the kind of things that a lot, I think it's arrogant that a lot of people make fun of, of them without at least learning what they're saying. It's a better thing to be able to say, I see what you're trying to do, but you may make some mistakes in there and work, or what's wrong with just learning something from them? And so if we come to Hotep, Imhotep, I mean, the name Hotep just means peace, right? And the, you know, the fact of the matter is the evidence is all over the place, but there's something very strange because Imhotep is from um, the old kingdom from early Kemet. So he was definitely black. But you notice all the movie depictions is of some white dude, <laughs> right? And so, but here's the thing. The, the argument isn't all answers. The answers to everything in the universe is from the past. No, the argument is like Sankofa. In order to move forward, you need to understand your past. And part of, if we go back to education, a system that tries to tell you that throughout all history, black people are inferior, that you are endemically incapable of learning. If you tell an indigenous person, whether it's in Ecuador or in Colombia or in Peru, that you're savages and inferior, um, that, that's a form of, of damage on the soul. If you tell the truth that humanity is creative and many people from all background were trying to make their lives better. And they have handed down a wisdom from their mistakes and their successes. Then you understand that everybody, whether you're in Abayala, the American, or you're in Southern Africa, or you're in Oceania, just means if you have the creativity and the necessity, you too can act. And that's the message, the real message I see, not only from the Afri-ecologists or Afrocentrists, but I see that as the message of people like my colleague Alexis McLeod, because he studies ancient uh, philosophies and he, he and I reject comparative philosophy because comparative always treats Europe as a center and you're trying to figure out what others do that you can compare Europeans. He instead looks at how communities across the global South communicate with each other around knowledge, whether it's Mesoamerica with uh, ancient China, whether it's going to be Kori people of Australia with uh, Tamils in India, whether you're going to deal with Oza people with Wolof, the ideas. In other words, we got to cut this what um, Kontak Rai Balka calls epistemic apartheid. We need to get rid of that and just start getting back to learning from each other, the way I talked about learning earlier. So uh, that's how I approach those communities. And I don't only look at ancient African knowledge, I also look at ancient Indian knowledge. Well, even that's wrong to say because India was an imposition by the British. The Indus Valley knowledge. <laughs> I try to see what one can learn from the Inca, not again to exoticize the people, but it is interesting that the Inca, the way they look at Inca people, you know, the people from Peru, the way they look at the world is not in binaries or neat triumvirates. They deal with a complex mechanism that actually mirrors more the reality in which we live. But I know we're out of time. So what we could do is see about a time to meet up again, because as you could see, um, you asked a question that was so rich, I had to give a long answer. Don't say it if you don't mean it, because I have got plenty more questions. <laughs> that would be great. Uh, and I'm so appreciative of what you have shared. In closing for the time being, I would love to hear just a little bit about uh, this Fear of Black Consciousness book that you're working on or that you've got coming out in the next couple of years, if you'd be down to speak to that. Sure, not even the next couple of years. It's at press now. It, it, it'll it either come out at the end of this year or the beginning of January 2022. It's called Fear of Black Consciousness. It's related to our conversation right now. Basically, the short version is I talk about two kinds of uh, black consciousness. Lowercase b black consciousness, which is the way the world has imposed the identity black on people of many kinds, including African peoples. 
right? And that creates a double consciousness where you think what you are is the way the world that hates you think you are. And then there's the second capital B black consciousness is what happens when you say, wait a minute, I'm not the problem. It's a society that makes me into the problem. And now you become an agent of history. The anti-black racist society, colonial society, don't want people to have that uppercase B black consciousness because in what that requires is exactly what we talked about with Fanon. It requires you to be politically active. So I argue that black consciousness with a capital B is political. And what, and what it signals, if we wanna connect it to something like Black Lives Matter, a lot of people think Black Lives Matter is about saying that black people matter more than others, that's false. It's about a society that is, it's a response to society has treated black people as not mattering. But here's the thing, for black people to matter, it requires radicalizing democracy. So Black Lives Matter is really a fight for democracy. Black consciousness is about democracy. If you want to maintain an anti-Black racist society, you have to restrict the political life of people. And that's why we see people who are fighting against um, not only Black lives, but Indigenous lives. They fight against political access, like voting, speech, et cetera. So the book is ultimately a critique of white supremacy as narcissistic and point out a simple thesis that black uh, consciousness is linked to political action. And so it's called, and the reason it's feared of course, is because it, it ultimately is the expansion of democracy. And, 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 and I summarize it in, in, a, in a simple simple thing that may be familiar to you. Um, of what white consciousness is, the reason it's narcissistic is very straightforward. I was once sitting on a, uh, a, um, a thesis committee and the, the, the author had a chapter called, what do white people want? And he went through all kinds of elaborate literary stuff. And I said, but you know, a lot of people of color have always known what white people want. And a lot of, there's some white people who know what they want. And he said, well, what's that? And I said, everything. <laughs> I said, you know, the rest of the world, we get up in the morning, we don't say, I must have everything. We get up in the world saying, you know, I'd like my kids to have a good school. I'd like to know my family is safe. We just want to have something that makes our lives better. We don't have to have everything. But there's, but what, but the hubris of whiteness is the desire to have everything. Even, even the identity of being the victims. And so the book is a critique of white supremacist consciousness. And it brings out through pointing out the convergence or coextensivity of indigeneity, gender, sexuality, as they are manifested in a more rich conception of a politically active black consciousness. And it's being published by Penguin and Farao Giro Strauss. And yeah, it's at press. It, uh, it should become, I don't, you know, with, with books, you know, it depends on how you know, but it will be out either later this year or very beginning of January next year. And, uh, the, and the other book that's related to it that did come out this year is Freedom, Justice and Decolonization. And that one's with Routledge, but this other book would be very, um, very affordable because it's, um, you know, that press is known for, and it'll be coming out in multiple languages too, by the way, Fear of Black Consciousness. So um, I'll keep you updated, which as the translations come out. Thank you. I appreciate that. And congratulations. Looking forward to getting into that work. So I appreciate your putting that out there for folks. Thank uh, you. And I appreciate your inviting me to this. I enjoyed it very much. Yeah, no, thank you so much. Um, in closing, is there anything else you might want to add on to anything that we've gotten into thus far? Just a brief point. My condolences to so many who have lost loved ones this past year. And uh, it's, it's heart-wrenching because what you've lost is irreplaceable. And a lot of people don't understand that. People always try to get you to just get over your grief and forget it. They don't get it. No, you've lost the irreplaceable. And so my condolences. And uh, to everybody, I wish you health and safety. And in the midst, despite the despair, do find moments of joy because moments of joy will remind you of your humanity. Potent words to close out on. Thank you so much for sharing that and for your time today. Thank you. That's it for today's episode of Feral Visions, a decolonial feminist podcast brought to you by Liberation Spring. 
I've been your host, Anjali Nathupadhyaya, and I thank you for listening. I'm also curious to know what this dialogue evoked for you. I invite you to post your reflections and questions in the comments section below to continue our collective journey of unlearning, remembering, and imagining. If you want to share feedback, such as segment ideas or potential guests you'd like to hear on the show, email liberationspring at gmail.com. And don't forget to follow Feral Visions on SoundCloud or iTunes, where you can find our show archive. If you'd like more information on this show's topic or to donate to the project, check out liberationspring.com. Thanks to Catherine Petru and Nicole Gervasio of our technical production team and Climbing Poetry for our theme song. Be sure to tune in for next week's episode. And in the meantime, let's make our ancestors proud. The power of the people is louder than the evil. Deceitful and coward, people in power. All power to the people is the hour of the peaceful. Freedom is ours, yeah. Freedom is ours.